We are living in times like the world has never seen. We must be guided by the Word. This year, you are invited to a virtual camp meeting with the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. Sit down with the family and tune in live and get ready for three powerful speakers as they speak on different biblical topics, as they are guided by the Word. Dr. Gordon Beat, former president of the Southern Adventist University. The Word from the beginning. The Word builds community. The Word brings unity. Assistant to the president of the General Conference, Mike Ryan, will be speaking on Bible heroes guided by the Word. The Apostolic Church guided by the Word. The Reformers guided by the Word. Adventist pioneers guided by the Word. God's Last Day Church guided by the Word. President of the Chinese Union, Robert Falkenberg Jr. will be speaking on understanding the time the universe next door, our blessed hope. Good evening. Welcome to the Kentucky, Tennessee virtual camp meeting guided by the word. Tonight we get to hear our third presentation from Dr. Gordon Beats. Many of you, most of you probably know who Gordon Beats is. He retired after 19 years as president of Southern Adventist University. And even though he's retired, He's not done assisting with Adventist education. He currently serves as the Associate Director for Higher Education at the North American Division and also the Director of the Association of Adventist Colleges and Universities. Tonight, Dr. Gordon Beach is going to be sharing with us a message entitled, The Word Brings Unity. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us Together, even though we are spread about in our various homes, you can bring us into unity through your Holy Spirit, through your word, and also through the technology that we're bringing here. We pray that you would take charge of everything that is done in this service this evening. Speak through Elder Gordon Beats and let us have Holy Spirit tuned ears to hear the message that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. I am pleased to add my personal welcome to our 2020 online edition of the Kentucky Tennessee Camp Meeting. One of my conference responsibilities is to lend support to the health ministries area of our work. Your conference has recently added several new programs and materials that are available to your church for in-reach and outreach activities. A more detailed description of these resources can be found in our Health Ministries Resources booklet. A few of our most popular health ministry options include New Start Adult and Children's programs, health screening programs which segue nicely into other longer seminars such as Creation Life, an eight-week seminar learning to practice the health principles of choice, rest, environment, activity, trust, interpersonal relationships, outlook, and nutrition. Diabetes Undone, an eight-session program that provides a simple solution to address the root causes of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, and to reverse the disease through lifestyle-changing principles. Dr. Nedley's Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program, the Full Plate Diet, an eight-session program to learn how to fill your plate to lose weight. Journey to Wellness, 12-step program for individuals desiring to break free from addictions. And there are many more. Ellen White in Medical Ministry, page 259, says, It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great efforts to proclaim the gospel message. And in 3 John 1, verse 2, John shares, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. I pray for and encourage you that just such a blessing will be yours to experience. The following health tip has been prepared by our friends at Loma Linda University. Enjoy. Ever crave a juicy steak or tender serving of filet mignon? 
Well, you may be better off craving something other than red meat. A team of researchers at Loma Linda University Health have been investigating lifestyle and health for nearly 60 years in what's known as the Adventist Health Studies. What they've found is those who eat a vegetarian diet have a lower risk for chronic diseases, which ultimately translates into longer, healthier living. In our study, the vegetarians compared to the non-vegetarians do have a lower risk of chronic disease, a lower risk of high blood pressure, a lower risk of high cholesterol, a lower risk of diabetes, they are less obese, and a lower risk of dying from heart disease ultimately. The researchers recently discovered that vegetarians are 22% less likely to develop colorectal cancers, the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. So how can you start eating a vegetarian diet and experience the lifestyle benefits? If giving up meat entirely is too much, why not reconsider how often you eat meat? For example, try eating only fish or eat other meats only once a week to experience similar health benefits associated with a vegetarian lifestyle. The second tip is to eat fewer refined foods like sugar, desserts, snack foods, and fast food meals. Instead, we should eat more whole grains and natural foods like fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. The closer you get to some kind of natural state, growing your own garden, shopping at a local farmer's market, that can be very helpful. If you commit to following these tips, you can enjoy the benefits of lowering your risk for chronic disease and living six to nine years longer. There is your tip for the day on how you can live healthier, longer. Thank you for joining the 2020 Kentucky, Tennessee virtual camp meeting. You are invited to open your Bibles to John 17, 20 through 26. John 17, 20 through 26 reads as follows. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Good evening. I'm glad to see that you joined us again this evening, this Sabbath evening of camp meeting. I can't see that you've joined us, but I'm assuming that some of you have. You'll remember that Friday evening, we spoke about the word building community. The triune God who is in community from eternity created us to live together in communities of love not judging and evaluating each other. This morning, we talked about the word from the beginning. The word became flesh, dwelt among us and showed us in his life, the summary of all the commandments, love God and your neighbor as yourself. There would be no more Passovers with Jesus. They had had their last. There would be no more sharing of wine and breaking of bread with Jesus, for they had had their last. There would be no more trips with Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, for they had had their last. There would be no more suppers with Jesus, for they had had their last supper. The last supper was not exactly a love feast. The disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest on the way to the supper. Can you believe James and John had the nerve to ask Jesus for the right and left in his kingdom? And they even had their mommy do the asking. <laughs> the disciples were arguing like children about who would get to sit where at the supper. <clears throat> I get that seat. Oh, no, you don't. I was here first. Don't you push me. I'll push you if I like. 
Judas was confronted during the supper. I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. No, this was no family reunion meal where all was sweetness and light. Jesus, with a heaviness coming over him and knowing his time was short, seeks to prepare his disciples for what's coming. He predicts his betrayal and the disciples respond, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? <clears throat> the disciples are not as concerned about his betrayal as they were about their positions. They're not so concerned about Jesus as they are about themselves. Then Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Oh, not me, Lord. No, sir, I would die first. Then Jesus, amidst all this discord and disharmony among his disciples, in his final words before he takes the last walk down the long corridor to the gas chamber, in his concluding concern, before he carries the cross to his death, in his ending declaration, before they lead him to the electric chair, he pours out his heart, seeking to prepare them for what is to come. This picture is a picture that reminds me of a story my father used to tell. He grew up on a farm in North Dakota. And one day his mother told him to take a jar of water to his father, who was plowing a field with horses some distance from the house. My dad took the jar of water and walked out toward where his father was plowing the field. As he came over a little rise in the field and looked down to where his father was plowing, he noticed he was kneeling at the back of the plow. And my dad figured he was working on fixing something on the plow. The horses stood tossing their heads, ready to continue cultivating the field. As my dad got closer, he heard his father talking. He was not fixing the plow. He was kneeling there by the plow, praying. Praying for the nine children you see pictured here with their mother. One of them, each by name, as he was praying, he named each child. He heard his own name, Reinhold. It was as if he was standing on holy ground. How does Jesus conclude the last discordant supper? With prayer. He pours out his heart, seeking to prepare them for what is to come. He does that by praying for them. And in that same prayer, Jesus prays for us. So Jesus, just before he traverses the Kidron Valley for the last time to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will be arrested, just before he's crucified, he says, let us pray. <clears throat> and he shares his deepest concerns to God in the longest prayer of Jesus recorded in the Bible. The prayer is in John 17 and is in three parts. He prays for himself. Verses seven, seven, chapter 17, verses 1 to 5. He prays for his disciples, verses 6 to 19. And then he prays for us. If there's any place in the Bible where we are included in prayer, it's here. For Jesus says in verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. That is his disciples that are around him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. We have believed in Jesus because of the message of his disciples. What is the message of these last words of Jesus to his father? Mrs. White says, the instruction given me by one of authority is that we are to learn to answer the prayer recorded in the 17th chapter of John. We must make this prayer our first study. And what does Jesus pray for when he thinks of us? 2,000 years ago, he's less than 24 hours from the gallows. And what does he think of when he prays for us? He prays for our unity. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so the world may believe that you have sent me. 
prays for our unity, for our community. The last plea of Jesus to his Father was that all of them may be one, that we may be one. Friday evening, we spoke of the importance of community, even as the Trinity is one in community. There are many things that Jesus might have prayed for. He did not pray for our faith. He did not pray for our doctrinal purity. He did not pray for our wisdom. He did not pray for our health. He did not pray that we be obedient to the law. He prayed for our unity, that all of them may be one. A minister was preaching on this text once, and a little bright-eyed three-year-old girl listened intently as the minister said, God wants us to be one, to which the little girl replied, but I don't want to be one. I want to be four. <laughs> to be one, to live in community. Our national church right now is not doing extremely well demonstrating unity. Our international church is not doing very well demonstrating unity. Our country has not demonstrated unity. As we seem to be polarized around every feasible issue. How is your local church doing? Is there manifest love and unity and community in your church? Why is this unity important to Jesus? He gives three reasons in that prayer. The first reason is evangelism. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. What good is it to preach that Jesus sent by the Father if we don't show in our lives the unity that Jesus and his Father had? What virtue do truth-filled teachings hold if they don't result in love that demonstrates unity? What worth is there in holding to the truth if the grip on truth doesn't hold us together? What merit is true theories about the gospel if there's no love in those that hold those theories? It is as basic and simple as you can't communicate what you don't live. Jesus prays for our unity so that the world may believe you have sent me. It's all about evangelism. When we live in unity, we communicate God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. True unity. Ellen White says the world needs to see worked out before it the miracle that binds the hearts of God's people together in Christian love. <clears throat> so the first reason for our unity is evangelism. It's not easy. As Lucy says, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. It's easy to love in theory. It's easy to have unity in theory. But when we're asked if we love humanity, of course we love humanity. But our statements of truth are of no value if they don't translate into unity with people, even people that we don't like very much. It is the purpose of God that his children shall blend in unity. Do they not expect to live together in the same heaven? Is Christ divided against himself? The first reason in Jesus' prayer for our unity is evangelism. Jesus wants us to experience what he has experienced, what he's prepared us for in heaven. The second reason, I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I have identical twin daughters. They're born 13 minutes apart. They spent nine months sharing the same environment of the womb. They lived in the same home for 20 years. They went to the same school and took the same classes for 14 years. They got married on the same day. They did marry different husbands. <laughs> We're thankful for that. Being twins only goes so far. They each have three children, two girls, 21 years old, two boys, 18 years old, and two girls, 15 years old. They are alike in almost every way. It's not hard for my daughters to dwell together in unity. Our church was born in the United States of America. It grew up in the same culture. It developed its organization in the same social context. It grew its theological roots in the same religious soil. 
We started as a homogeneous church of like-minded people. If we did not always agree, and we didn't, at least we could argue from the same platform of cultural and social experience. Today, <clears throat> we have a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic, international church. What is the glue that will hold us together in worldwide unity? I broke a lamp the other day and my wife asked me to glue it back together. I had lots of choices. I could use hot glue, instant glue, wood glue, epoxy glue. I had to choose the glue that would hold that lamp together. What's the glue that will hold our church together? Jesus came to bring us into the family of God as brothers, yet Religious hatred and violence run rampant through the entire civilized world. And antiseptic euphemism for mass murder is, the rampant, is rampant in the world. The Israelis and Palestinians die in strife because of different visions of the Holy Land. There's religiously inspired conflicts in every corner of the world. We're separated by race and language, poverty and wealth. Will what we hold in common transcend our differences? Will we be able to stand together while our countrymen are breaking up into enclaves of hatred and killing each other? The struggle for civilization has always been a struggle for unity. The great golden ages of civilization have been periods of commonality when large parts of the world were more or less united by common values, language, and laws. The Roman Empire, the era of Charlemagne, the Renaissance, periods that have been succeeded in turn by periods of fragmentation, fractional strife, and relative barbarism. You would think we live in an enlightened age, but it's amazing to think that there's been more death from our religiously inspired conflict in our century than during the Inquisition. There's been more persecution in our century, or the last century, than during the time of Nero and pagan Rome. Will we find our identity in tribalism, independent national churches, or will we find cross-cultural unity in the faith of our fathers? Will we fracture over the Trinity or the nature of Christ or the style of worship or the style of dress or women's ordination, or can we hold together? Will we find our identity in that which separates us or that which unites us? Jesus came to tear down walls that we build between us. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus has destroyed the barrier. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Jesus prays for our unity. First, so we can witness. Second, so we can taste the glory of the heavenly experience of unity he has with his Father. And third reason he prays for our unity is, so the world may know of his love. I and them, you and me, so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What will the world know? That God loves them as God loves the Son. Not just that God loves the church, he loves the world. Not just that God loves the Christian, but he loves everybody. Our unity is portrayed in love. People see how we love one another. See, people see how we live in harmony. We tell you we have the truth. How do you know? You can see it in our lives and how we love one another and how we dwell together in unity. <clears throat> Ellen White says, union with Christ and with one another is our only safety in these last days. Let us not make it possible for Satan to point to our church members, saying, behold how these people standing under the banner of Christ hate one another. We taste heaven on earth as we answer this prayer of Jesus, praying for our unity so the world will believe, so we can experience heavenly unity, so the world will know of his love. Do you know what happened in the first to the first love in the early church? This is a fascinating quotation. Ellen White says the early Christians began to look for defects in one another. 
dwelling upon mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism, they lost sight of the Savior and of the great love he had revealed for sinners. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies. Listen to this. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory of faith, and more severe in their criticisms. What happened? When they lost sight of Jesus, what happened? They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, they attended church more often, and they were more concerned about the style of worship. They became more particular about the theory of faith. They talked about the truth instead of living the truth. They argued about doctrinal truth instead of living loving lives. They became more severe in their criticisms. They focused on the faults of others instead of reflecting on their own needs. I'm reading a massive 784-page book on the Crusades about war in the Holy Land. What an oxymoron. War over a holy land? It is a fact that the noble-minded of history have done more evil many times than those intent on vice. For example, the Crusades were conducted by noble-minded people seeking to do what they considered to be the will of God. Comedian Phillips used to tell this story. In a conversation with a person I had met, I asked, are you Protestant or Catholic? My new acquaintance replied, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He answered, Baptist. Me too, I said. Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist, he replied. Me too, I shouted. Northern Baptist, conservative fundamentalist, Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Baptist, conservative fundamentalist, Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. Northern conservative fundamentalist, Baptist Great Lake Region Council of 1912, he replied. I said, die heretic. Quite a story. So often we focus on what divides us than on what unites us. Jesus, after his Last Supper, prays for our unity. What is this unity like? This kind of unity is not uniformity, but unity in Jesus with all of our diversity. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, though many, we form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We all belong to each other. If the body were all head, foot, or hand, it would be useless. If all of your convictions were exactly like mine, one of us would be unnecessary. Ellen White says, harmony and union existed among men of varied dispositions is the strongest witness. Notice, harmony and union is the strongest witness that can be born that God has sent his son into the world to save sinners. Each of us approach the teachings of the church and scripture from different perspectives. That is not to say there should not be doctrinal agreement on some basic issues, but our unity is not in creedal statements, but in Christ. It is the mind of Satan that seeks to develop robot uniformity. Bible Readings for the Home, written in 1944, gives us the bigot's creed. Believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else confess. Feel as I feel, think only as I think, eat what I eat, drink what I drink. Look as I look, do always as I do, and only then will I fellowship with you. That I am right and always right, I know, because my own convictions tell me so. And to be right is simply this, to be entirely and in all respects like me. To deviate a jot or to begin to question, doubt, or hesitate is sin. Let's sink the drowning man if he'll not swim upon the plank that I throw out to him. Let's starve the famishing if he'll not eat my kind and quantity of bread and meat. Let freeze the naked too if he'll not be supplied with garments such as made for me. T'were better that the sick should die than live, unless they take the medicine I give. 
for better sinners perish than refuse to be conformed to my peculiar views. For better that the world stood still than move in any way that I do not approve. We must be so careful not to use the truth as bricks to build ivory towers for ourselves. We must be so careful not to use the truth, the doctrines, the teachings to separate us from each other. The truth is to build bridges to people rather than walls. Our unity is not for better defending ourselves from the world, but for the purpose of showing the world God's love for them. I used to tell stories when I was preaching at the Collegedale Church for the 13 years I was pastor. And the stories at the end of my sermons were parables built in Fenton Forest. And so I conclude with a parable this evening. Once upon a time in Fenton Forest, there was a forest family fight. It all began at Murky Marsh in the upper arm of Paddle Pond, where Bucky Beaver was cutting down some trees to make his dam over Crashing Creek higher so he could build a larger house. He hadn't cut very far past the bark when Scamper Squirrel came chattering down the tree, squealing at the top of his lungs, Stop destroying my house! What do you think you're doing? I'm building my dam higher and my house larger, replied Bucky as he began to gnaw on the bark again. But you're tearing down my house. This is my tree. Scamper was so angry, he screamed at the top of his lungs and bounced up and down on his legs. At about the same time, Bright Bluebird appeared on the opening of a hole in the tree. What's going on? Bright said. Bucky, I live here too, and why are you cutting down this tree? I have to live, and I'm working on my dam and my house. I need trees, Bucky exclaimed. I have a growing family. The loud arguments and noise brought other inhabitants of the forest to see what was going on. I think Bucky's right, said Gruff the Bear. Scamper and Bright should move to some other tree. And how long will it be until Bucky cuts down that tree, said Bright. I know, Scamper said. Bucky, you know the big delicious tree in front of Gruff's house? the one he likes to lay in the shade of when it's hot in the middle of the day? I give you permission to go over and cut down that tree. Oh, no, you don't, roared Gruff. Not if you know what's good for you. See, Scamper spoke to Gruff. You want us to move, but you won't move. Why is your shade tree more important than the tree that we live in? Because I'm bigger than you are. Just then, wise old owl flew up to see what all the trouble was about. He took the scene in with a glance and asked Bucky, do you know why this tree is in this place? No, he said. It's probably because of the work of some of Scamper's grandparents. They spread seeds around and ate nuts, and so this true tree grew right here. Then, turning to Scamper, wise old owl said, Do you like the pond and the marsh here? Yes, they both replied in unison. Why do you think it's here? They agreed that it was the regular work of Bucky Beaver that maintained the pond. You see, you need each other. Wise old owl intoned, Fenton Forest is a community. Let's not live together like we lived alone. Let's be sure as communities of faith that we live together in communities of love where we uplift Jesus as the one who unites us and answer his prayer that we live together in unity. Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us an example of how to live. We pray that we might have the courage to live that way in our churches, in our homes, in our communities, and in our nation. In the name of your Son. Amen. What a timely message. In a time when our world has never felt more divided, we needed that encouragement to find unity in the Word. Tonight's message concludes Elder Beats' message during this camp meeting. And on behalf of all of us, thank you, Elder Beats, for reminding us of the primacy of the Word and inspiring us to walk closer to Jesus and with each other. 
While we're saying goodbye to Elder Beats, we're just getting started with this camp meeting. So join us right here tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, as Elder Mike Ryan, who serves as assistant to the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, brings us a sermon entitled, Bible Heroes Guided by the Word. You won't want to miss it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for what we've heard this evening. We do pray that you would bring us together, unite us in you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.